Did spectroscopy, the study of how objects emit and absorb light, really revolutionize the sciences and change our world? In a word, yes. In chemistry, spectroscopy was used to find new elements, and infrared spectroscopy is still used in chemical analysis to this very day. In astronomy, spectroscopy allowed us to figure out what the sun and stars are composed of and is the most powerful tool in the astronomer's toolbox. And physics? Ah, uh, physics is where spectroscopy had the most influence. For spectroscopy directly led to the development of quantum mechanics. And all of this began when a shy, small physicist named Gustav Kirchhoff suggested that his friend, a large, absent-minded chemist named Robert Bunsen, use a prism. Ready for one of my favorite stories? Let's go! Electricity, 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 electricity. Kirchhoff and Bunsen met because of a revolution, several revolutions actually. See, in 1848, young Gustav Kirchhoff won a scholarship to travel from Prussia to France for his astonishing work that he had done as an undergrad on how complicated circuits follow Ohm's law that is still causing students in engineering and physics to butcher the spelling of his name today. However, the summer of 1848 was the beginning of, quote, the most widespread revolutionary wave in European history. Therefore, Kirchhoff only made it as far as Berlin. Undeterred, he talked his way into a temporary position at the University of Berlin and then in a position at the University of Breslau where he became close friends with a visiting chemist named Robert Bunsen. Bunsen was a renowned chemist, but also an eccentric character, so famous for his amusing quirks that his friends wrote an entire book about his humorous stories. For example, Bunsen was a lifelong bachelor, but according to legend, he had once asked a woman for a hand in marriage and had been accepted. However, after that, he got so involved in his research, he forgot to talk to his fiancee for several weeks he also forgot whether he had proposed or not. Undeterred, he just went to the young lady and proposed again. Insulted, she changed her mind and promptly showed him the door. Anyway, in 1852, Bunsen got a chemistry position at the University of Heidelberg and used his influence to get Kirchhoff a physics position there too. A few years later, Bunsen heard that the town was to be supplied with gas to light the street lamps at light and homes at night. Bunsen then worked out a deal with the gas company to supply his laboratory with gas during the day. Bunsen then realized that the gas burners available were unsteady and did not produce a lot of heat. He then set out to make a better one and by 1857 published the description of a Bunsen burner, a device still in use in chemistry laboratories throughout the world. However, Bunsen would never think of patenting his device, writing once that Working is beautiful and rewarding, but acquisition of wealth for its own sake is disgusting. Bunsen thus had a very good heat source to play with and decided, as he was a chemist, to systematically study the light produced by different chemical salts when they burned. Bunsen tried to qualify the colors by studying them through colored filters, which didn't work very well. One day in the summer of 1859, he complained to Kirchhoff, who wondered why he didn't just use a prism. Physicists had known since Newton's time that prisms bend different colors by different amounts and could make a rainbow. However, when they looked at heated low density gases with a prism, they didn't see a rainbow. In fact, the gases would make sharp bars of specific frequencies called spectral lines. This is not to say that Bunsen and Kirchhoff were the first to study spectral lines with a prism. They weren't. What made this different is that Kirchhoff was suggesting that they use a movable arm so they could systematically study the colors produced by different elements. They soon found that each element had its own unique optical fingerprint. What is going on? Well, the electrons in a gas are bound to the nucleus and can only exist at certain energy levels. When they are heated, the electrons will jump up energy levels. Then, when they fall back down, they release a photon of light whose energy and color depends on the change of energy levels. Different elements have different energy levels, so they produce different bands of light. Bunsen and Kirchhoff built their first spectroscope out of Bunsen's old cigar box, some telescope parts, a prism, and of course, a Bunsen burner. Despite being crude, this was a surprisingly sensitive device. 
Bunsen noted that, quote, chemistry produces no single reaction which in the remotest degree can compare in sensitiveness. They found, for example, they could see sodium when as little as one out of 20 millionth of it was suspended in smoke. They also found that they could burn compounds and from their fingerprints determine what they were composed of. Bunsen and Kirchhoff burned some compounds and found some fingerprints that didn't correspond to any known chemical and in this way discovered two unknown elements, rubidium and cesium. That's not all. In October, Kirchhoff was playing with a fingerprint of sodium and as a lark decided to add the light from a bright lamp. Kirchhoff knew that his lamp, like most heated liquids and solids and plasma gas, would produce basically a continuous spectrum or rainbow. Therefore, with both a lamp and heated sodium, he expected to see a rainbow with two extra bright yellow lines from the sodium. To Kirchhoff's shock, he got a rainbow with two black bands in the yellow, exactly at the spots where the bright lines were supposed to show. Excitedly, this rainbow with black bands in it looked like sunlight. See, sunlight is not actually continuous rainbow, but if you study it with a really good prism and a microscope, you will see little dark bands in it. The fact that sunlight has dark bars was first discovered in 1802, but was made famous 12 years later by a German glassmaker named Joseph Fraunhofer, who counted over 570 lines in sunlight. Kirchhoff therefore realized that he was recreating the Fraunhofer lines of sunlight with lamplight and sodium. It seemed immediately clear to Kirchhoff that the shadows in the yellow part of sunlight must be due to the sodium gas on the sun. Let me explain in detail, because it is both really amazing and a little bit complicated. The sun is a hot plasma, where the elements are so dense and hot that the electrons are ripped free from their atoms and are free to move. Therefore, the electrons in the sun produce a continuous spectrum of light. The atmosphere of the sun, however, has spots cool enough for the elements to be in gas form instead of plasma form, although they are still ridiculously hot, hot enough that even the metals are in gas form. As these gases are cooler than the sun, they absorb more radiation than they produce. Therefore, the gas elements in the atmosphere of the sun will leave the shadows of their optical fingerprints in sunlight. By studying the optical fingerprints on Earth and comparing it to the optical shadows from the sunlight, Kirchhoff had found a way to determine what the sun was composed of. Soon, Kirchhoff and Bunsen found many different elements in the sun. But no helium, as helium was actually discovered because of the shadows in the sunlight. Which is why helium is named after Helios, the Greek sun god. Kirchhoff and Bunsen even found trace amounts of gold in the sun. It's true, about 60th of a billionth of a percent of the sun is made of gold gas. But as the sun is so large, there's about as much gold in the sun as water in the oceans of the earth. Kirchhoff liked to tell the story of how his banker was unimpressed about finding gold in the sun as he couldn't bring it to earth and put it in his bank. Soon after, Kirchhoff won a prize for this work and told his banker, look here, I have succeeded at last in fetching some gold from the sun. But wait, we aren't done yet. In 1860, Kirchhoff wrote a theoretical physics paper about the emission and absorption of light. In this paper, Kirchhoff imagined a perfect object that would completely absorb all incident rays, which Kirchhoff called perfectly black, or more briefly, black bodies. If it absorbed all incident light, then any light that emitted from a black body would be from the substance itself being heated. And Kirchhoff theoretically predicted that the amount of light you get only depends on the temperature of the substance and the frequency you're looking at. Kirchhoff didn't have a theoretical form for this equation, but he felt that, quote, to determine this function is a matter of the greatest importance, although he is sure of success, since the form of the function in question is no doubt simple. The equation turned out to be pretty simple, but it was very difficult to create the experiment and find a good theoretical logic behind it. In fact, it took 40 years to solve the black body radiation puzzle. In 1900, a man named Max Planck wrote a paper deriving the black body equation, where as he put it, quote, the most essential point of the entire calculation is that energy is composed of very definite number of equal finite packages. Five years later, Einstein called these energy packets quanta of light. 
In other words, in 1900, Max Planck started the quantum mechanics revolution because of black body radiation. And that story is next time on The Lightning Tamers. Thanks for watching my video. If you liked it, please give it a thumbs up and share it on social media. If you have any questions, I'll try my best to answer it in the comments below. Also, if you really liked it, please consider being a Patreon. I have a link down below. You can be part of the community. You get a videos a day early and you get special videos. Speaking of special videos, I am making a special video with a lot of the stories about Bunsen that I couldn't include in this video, as well as a story about Fraunhofer, the guy who discovered that visible light has those dark lines in it, why he did that and why he could only do that because a building collapsed around him when he was a teenager. Also, I'm including a little bit about a husband and wife team who were pioneers in using spectroscopy with astronomy and with photography. They're especially interesting because William Huggins was quite willing to let his wife work with him, but was simultaneously working against women getting acknowledgments in science. It's a very interesting story or a very annoying story, depending on your point of view. By the way, if you want to see the video, but you don't have the money to be a Patreon, I understand. I have a link to an email. Shoot me an email and I'll send you a copy of the video. I'm a sucker. Okay, have a nice day.